welcome everyone. Thanks for coming in. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as, as usual, there will be a few people that sneak in, uh, but the back row is taken, so you'll see them come through. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll let them come in when they make it. So again, thanks for coming. It's cold today, so the room's full. So that's good to, good to see. You know, the last two weeks it's been, you know, in the 50s, so everyone was doing stuff. But hopefully it's too cold to work, so we're glad you can make it. Uh, we've got a, a real good lineup today. Pretty happy uh, for uh, what we have coming up. Uh, Paul Yasu will be first up to talk a little bit about equipment. Um, and then, as usual, you'll see on your agenda, we'll have a discussion in the middle. We have Stephen Vainziger from uh, uh, the university. We'll, uh, he'll kind of be a part of the general discussion and share a little bit about what he's doing. And then uh, we'll finish up with Nathan Mueller, an extension educator up in Fremont. And many of you probably know Nathan. And uh, anyway, so he'll share a little bit more about growing wheat in eastern Nebraska. And, uh, again, want to thank the uh, uh, Nebraska Wheat Board. We have Royce here from the, from the Wheat Board. Uh, they're our sponsor today. I uh, really appreciate them helping out. Uh, that allows us to put all these things together in uh, the snacks and the handouts and all that good stuff. So, again, make sure if you see them, thank them. Uh, even some of the handouts you have have the probably have their logo somewhere in it. So the, they're very helpful when it comes to helping the university out look at, and uh, when we're trying to educate on wheat. So, again, thanks for them. A uh, couple uh, housekeeping things. I think everyone knows where the restrooms are at and there's some snacks. Again, a couple sign-up sheets in the back for CCAs. Remind people that if you have that, go ahead and uh, sign up. With that, I don't think I need to ramble on anymore. <laughs> um, again, first up is Paul Yasa, uh, the extension engineer. Most of you have heard Paul. If you've been here before, you've uh, then you've heard him here. So uh, he'll talk a little bit about uh, wheat and equipment, but uh, you know he's a no-till guy, so he's uh, going to tell you a little bit about that as well. So I'll go ahead and Turn it over to him, and I'll get your PowerPoint going. And thanks for coming. Thank you, Tyler. And uh, I have not seen Nathan's presentation. When I'm talking equipment here, I'm going to talk a little bit about some reasons you should be growing wheat. I'm going to show some equipment to help that. Hopefully, that's on Nathan's list of these reasons to grow wheat. Uh, equipment basics. Uh, as Tyler said, I'm a no-tiller, so a lot of things I do, I'm looking at what are we going to do different for no-till compared to till. Uh, when it comes to wheat, uh, you know, if you're grandfathers or fathers may raise wheat in this area. It got phased out over the years. It's coming back in. I'm going to show some of the equipment for wheat. I'm going to show some of the equipment for no-tilling, corn, grain, sorghum, soybeans as well, simply because we do have a crop rotation. It's not just monocrop of wheat. At least I hope not. You guys back uh, west found out you shouldn't be doing that. Again, a variety of tillage systems. I don't know if we can show this first set of lights, or do you need that for the camera? Make it a little, that's a little better. Anyway, there's a variety of tillage systems out there. And when it comes to uh, tillage, uh, conservation tillage, uh, we middle ones there, leaving some residue, we're finding out the best system to go with is actually no-till when it comes to getting that system working with you. And when it comes to uh, around the world, they call it conservation agriculture. Here in the States, we call it no-till. So the key principles are we're trying to do minimal soil disturbance. Uh, to keep that soil covered as much as we can. Have a diversity of plants out there, and that's where wheat really comes into play. It adds a cool season grass to our crop rotation, because we're typically corn soybeans here in eastern Nebraska. Uh, corn soybeans are both warm season, a broadleaf and a grass, and they have uh, grain sorghum and other warm season grass. So just throwing in diversity, getting a cool season crop in there, and better yet, if we can find a cool season broadleaf we can grow, it'd be nice to have. One of the keys for uh, good healthy soil though is uh, living root year round. It's taking the carbon dioxide and sunlight energy from the atmosphere that's free that we waste in the off season. We can grow it as a biological form and those roots then are gonna put carbon into the soil as the roots are feeding the soil system. Uh, the soil system then feeds the, print, uh, the plants. There's a lot of interest now in the soil health, how it makes the soil much more resilient. I got on the bottom of the list, integrate livestock. Uh, when it comes to worldwide, there's a lot of people looking at bringing livestock in to help build soil health as well. Uh, the research that, uh, I should say Stu Hoff sitting here, Stuart and I work out at the Rogers Memorial Farm. We don't have livestock out there. We're building soil health. But there's a lot of extra options if you have livestock in the system. And uh, again, one of the things uh, I want to put on that list is uniformity. Think uniformity every day of the year when working out in the field. And uh, in front of all these tillage implements, for instance, it's a uniform height of residue, uniform spread of residue. Uh, uniformity makes things a lot easier. And here's one of our fields, uh, Rogers Front Royal Farm, already planted. A lot of people look at that and say, well, don't you have to move residue? I go, why? Every seed is in the same soil moisture, the same soil temperature, under the same residue cover. 
that's going to give you the most uniform stand. Uh, uniformity, uh, herbicide, uniformity applied, rained in, activated. Uniformity, where did the combine run the year before harvesting those soybeans? If you can see that in the field, I can guarantee you may have some problems, may have some problems when it comes to uh, no-till systems approach. And again, a lot of people don't think too much that little pile of residue hiding there in the combine axle. You know, I don't think too much of it either when it falls off and plugs up the wheat drill. The so majority of the residue handling problems people have at drilling time, at uh, corn planting time, fertilizer time, the majority of the residue problems is they didn't handle the residue at harvest time. You have to get the residue spread behind the combine. When it comes to platform heads, you have to have chaff distribution. This combine does not. It's got a good chopper on it. Uh, some people love a chopper, especially when you're getting started at no-till, because it takes the residue, breaks it open, spreads it out. The broken open residue contacts cell microbes and breaks down quickly. I hate the chopper because it breaks the residue open, gets in contact with soil microbes, and it breaks down quickly. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to leave more residue in the field, so we quit running the chopper years ago. Chaff distribution is missing here. There's a windrow of soybean pods. Uh, then there's a little bearer strip, another windrow of soybean pods. And think next spring when it comes to planting conditions or seeding wheat that fall. Two different soil temperatures, two different soil moistures, two different levels of residue. Again, uniformity every day of the year. Again, when it comes to wheat harvest, uh, people have been doing that for years, trying to spread that residue out uh, if they don't bale it up. Now, I prefer not to bale it up and remove it. I want to leave the carbon in the field. I want to leave the nutrients in that residue in the field. I want to leave the mulch in the field. And so again, uniform spread of residue, uniform height of residue. You don't see a windrow out there. Uh, this is a straw storm and chaff storm. That In the olden days, we had to put these on our combines because combines weren't really designed to spread residue, especially on wider head. Good news is, is Consumers, we've demanded it. Industry responding get us better spread. Uh, the new John Deere uh, power board, uh, power tail, or whatever they call it, can do an awesome job of spreading residue. So again, we're demanding it. They're doing it for us. Makes no-till a lot easier. Uh, if there's some stripper headers moving into eastern Nebraska, out western Nebraska, western Kansas, Colorado. You see a lot of them. When it comes to harvesting wheat, it's basically a comb that combs the kernels off the berries off the heads and just brings it up in basically combines just a big grain cleaner then. The plus when it comes to no-till is it leaves the residue anchored attached standing there. I don't have to spread the residue. Like I say, there's a few of them creeping in, in eastern Nebraska now. Uh, they're a little expensive, but the no-tillers love it for that standing residue. Uh, then, like I say, you still have to spray the chaff in back, but it's a lot easier to spread just chaff compared to the volume of straw that we used to take through these combines. And here's out western Nebraska, irrigated wheat, uh, producer planting down through it, no attachments on the planter. That stripper head harvested wheat residue out western Nebraska is gold when it comes to keeping the sun and wind off the soil surface when it comes to soil moisture conservation. So again, we are seeing more and more of that. Now, eastern Nebraska may or may not like it, and the reason they may not like it is uh, our snows out here are wet compared to their snows out west. And I, ha I heard a Great line this last week. Uh, there was a North Dakota meeting I was at. He said, it was 20 below. And someone looked at him and said, yes, but it's a dry cold. It is a difference. But when that first snow comes, if it is a wet snow with wind, there's stripper head harvested wheat stubble in um, South Dakota here. You don't see that tall residue standing up. That makes a mat there that um, out there, that's fine because it's reducing moisture evaporation. But here in eastern Nebraska, you make a mat like that, you get a rainfall event. It might be days before it dries out under that mat to be able to get in the field. I like residue standing up so wind can get down to the soil surface. I like to make the mat when I plant because then I want to plant the residue to absorb raindrop impact. Now this producer, he was out there, he's planting through that. Some of the residue standing up, some wasn't. But again, when you get that long residue out there, you get rid of anything in the planter that turns that you don't necessarily need. Residue movers up front can wrap up in a hurry on long residue. Got rid of the residue movers, he's just slicing in. He's actually planting sunflowers in this field. Again, got wheat in the rotation there to give them uh, some extra residue. Rogers Memorial Farm, we run the silver cedar. We don't run the chopper. Uh, Stu cuts the residue as high as he can. We want that residue tall simply so it doesn't contact the soil, so it doesn't break down. Once it contacts the soil, it starts breaking down for us. And it may look a little ugly there, but you know, by next spring, it's easy to plant through, anchored, attached. Again, depends upon the winter. Some springs are wheat still golden, there's other springs. Uh, ours is flat ground as well. So again, it depends. And that is easy to plant through because it's standing up. If it's flattened, then you have to cut it. 
I'm showing wheat residue here, but same thing's true on grain, sorghum, soybean, not so much, but corn residue. Anchor the tap standing up. Corn residue, harvest time. You don't need the chaff spreader. You don't need the chopper. You don't need a corn reel if the corn head is doing the proper job. Corn head on this cat combine is uh, designed by Capella Head. It's a knife to knife design. Grips the corn stalk, releases the corn stalk, grips the corn stalk, crushes it, pulls it down, snaps the ears off. I see too often where producers are putting corn reels on, pushing residue through the combine. I go, why? The grain's on the ear. This is uh, up near Snyder, Nebraska. The year I took this picture, he had a seven pivot average of 265 bushels per acre. Look how little residue is coming out of the back in that big cat combine. That's 18, 20 inch rows, by the way, going in there. So again, the corn head's processing the residue. That's what we want to do. Again, this is a field of about 90 bushel dryland corn residue just outside of Lincoln. Who'd be afraid of no tilling or something like that? It's not much residue, but that was a combine that had intermeshing snapping rolls and it doesn't process the corn stalks. What happens is the intermeshed corn stalk can't get between it, so as you're driving along, you basically are combing the ears off and leaning the stalks. That stalk's not been crushed, it's not been opened up. Now, you start planting, six row combine, 12 row planter. The first six rows are leaning that way, the planter's going that way, no problem. Next six rows are leaning towards you and you test snow till because every loose hose, wire, cable, chain just got snagged on that planter. Again, that's not a planter problem, that's a harvest problem. Combine two passes the same direction, two passes back, plant the direction the stalks are leaning, problems tend to go away. You gotta start thinking systems approach how each step affects the next. Now, the longer you're no-till, the more you're gonna like residue like that, standing up, not breaking down. First year or two in no-till, you're gonna test that because that residue seems like it lasts forever. But again, depends where you're at, what you're trying to do. Farmer in Kansas I met, he says, oh, just put a lean bar out front, lean the stalks the same direction you're going. Uh, a little bit of a fertilizer program there, don't have time to talk about fertilizer as well, but again, when it comes to a lean bar, here's on an air seeder. Again, he can fill it full of concrete, make sure he leans the stalks over. He's planting wheat into sunflower as those sunflower stalks are pretty stiff. Just knock them over, plant wheat right there. Here's a producer who's got full fertilizer system. Uh, there's fertilizer systems available that you can put down some anhydrous at the same time. They do some separation from the seed. He's got liquid, two different forms there. He's got uh, seeding his wheat with fertilizer. This producer says, you know what? I don't have wheat on every acre, but I can use that rig on every acre of this corn, what's going to corn, as this fertilizer applicator. Saves money by not having a separate anhydrous bar, just uses that seeder that he already has. So again, it opens up some options. And this is a producer who says, I don't have enough acres of wheat to justify buying the air seeder. Wait a minute, if I do all my corn fertilizer program, now I've got enough acres to justify the seeder, now I've got enough to justify wheat. So again, think of up other options, how you can bring things into the rotation. I love this lean bar. You gotta meet this producer, he's about this big. I think he just stuck it up there with one hand and stuck the bolt in. But again, lean the stalks over. So Rogers Memorial Farm, years ago, we used to have a combine that had knife-to-knife -knife snap and rolls. Overprocessed the residue. Now, early days of no-till, that looks nice. That's the day after harvest. This is a different field, but here's what a lot of our fields look like the next spring. Our biological activity is such that our residue is breaking down, disappearing. So we got rid of the, <coughs> got rid of the oh, knife to knife snapping rolls. Our gleaners got tapered snapping rolls. We run the head higher and get that residue to hang around longer. And so again, we think about residue processing. Over 200 bushel corn, look out coming out of the back of the combine. Just husks and cobs. Corn heads processing the residue. Makes no till a lot easier. Again, we want uniformity every day of the year. Uh, we haven't had a lot of snow this year, but we want uniform snow catch. Uh, I don't want some snow to blow away. You know, here's a picture that Stuart took a couple years ago, and you see the corn stalks just stand up a little bit. No, that's not corn stalks. That's grain sorghum there, 24 inch deep snow. That was a couple years ago when we had snow. But again, that's good moisture. That's uniform cover. More important though, that's insulation to the soil surface. That snow we had at Christmas time, we got a nice little layer of snow. And we got that 20 below a couple days after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's. Weather station Rogers Morrow Farm tells me we are not frozen four inch deep yet. And it's simply because that snow cover and where our temperature sensor is actually is in the cool season grass. So we have some protection there, some biological activity there. Again, insulation, I would like that, keep the soil warmer. Protects uh, wheat as well to reduce winter kill when you get that snow cover out there. Here's out in wheat country where uh, one producer is a no tiller, the other is a tillage guy. The guy says, well, you want that snow to blow away so the sunlight can warm up that black soil. 
Well, it turns out that without the insulation, that black soil actually freezes and takes longer to warm up compared to where the snow cover is. The standing wheat stubble is catching soil moisture. Now on the tilt side, there's some areas that's gonna be no snow, there's some areas that are normal snow, there's some areas that might be a drift two, three, four feet deep. And again, come next spring, that's three different soil temperatures, three different soil moistures. So much for uniformity. So again, think uniformity every day of the year. Uh, tile spades full of soil from our long-term uh, tillage comparison out at Rogers Memorial Farm. Uh, on your left is the no-till. You can see good soil aggregation there near the soil surface. On the right is from the till. It's dense. Not as much air movement, not as much uh, water percolation. But coming from below is also heat rising. There's some work being done in France saying that with well-structured no-till soil and heat coming from below, in March, they're measuring soil temperatures about 8 to 10 degrees warmer in no-till than in till. That's because that heat can rise. And again, at the Rogers Memorial Farm, our goal is to have all our corn, soybeans, and uh, grain soil implanted by May 1. Soil temperatures aren't a problem because we've got good soil structure. We've got biological activity. We've got residue cover. And so again, think about that. Now, when I took this picture, I should have lined them up with the tilled one about four inches lower. Here's why. Tillage has beat down the soil structure. It is four inches lower than the no-till next to it. Now, this is a few years ago. I went with beans into grain soil in one of those plots. So it's corn bean rotation now. Again, herbicides reined in, activated. Uh, when you're thinking about putting wheat in the rotation, you got to think about your herbicides and your residuals for planting wheat that fall. And so again, little things start adding up when you think about systems approach. Uh, but here on the tilled side, we've got some beans under a crust. We've got some beans in dry soil. And some beans that aren't going to grow. On the no-till side, every bean's up and growing. We know where the soil moisture is. We can plant to it. Talk a little bit about planters. Talk more about drills and air seeders. But again, to think about Cut and handle residue, penetrate the soil desired seeding depth, establish seed to soil contact, close the seed beat. Those are the key steps when we think about differences of no-till and till. Now I might ask for steps five, six, seven, eight. It might be fertilizer, fungicide, insecticide, herbicide, uh, depends what all you want to put on the planter. You know what, you fail on those first four, it doesn't matter. Now, actually fail the first one that I didn't even list, neither the seed, it doesn't matter. But here's an old 1260 runner planter. Runner couldn't cut the first stick of resin at first step. Put a colder out front, run along like a pizza cutter to cut the residue. That lightweight runner planter couldn't penetrate soil desired seeding depth. Again, that colder till to loosen the soil and it's easy to penetrate. That till to loosen the soil is easy to get seed soil contact, close the seed. We call that a no-till attachment. No, it wasn't. It was putting tillage back in the system, just not full width tillage. Now, actually, that's the new version. The old version, the original, was about a four-inch wide wavy colder. Then it went down to two, then it went down to one, then it went down to basically no folders now. The reason being is industries responded and give us no-till without the tillage. Everybody on planters has gone to double disc openers. A lot of the drills are going to disc openers. That disc is sharper than any colder on the market. It can cut residue. And when it comes to residue cutting ability, it is sharper and heavier than any tillage disc on the market. I get a lot of producers say, I can't handle that residue. They go hook on their disc and try discing it. And I go, well, how deep you plant? Oh, about like this. How deep the disc? Oh, about like this. Take a look at the sales literature on a big, heavy offset disc. You'll be lucky to find one that's 200 pounds per blade down pressure. On a finishing disc, they're only 75 to 100 pounds per blade. That planter unit already weighs a couple hundred pounds. We put on down pressure springs to weigh a couple hundred more. I get more cutting ability there than any tillage implement when it comes to cutting residue. Make sure the disc is sharp working together. You know, that's part of my planter talk. Some companies have staggered discs, one in front of the other. Which is better? Doesn't really matter as long as the discs are sharp working together. Now, I do like the stagger design because as they go to stagger, it disturbs less soil area. With less soil disturbance, I can get this field a little sooner after a rain. Uh, a red planter with a staggered disc, for instance, can go to the field a day or two before a green planter. So again, we like the staggered design. And here's a producer I worked with back in the 80s who says, you know, without a residue mover up front, without a colder up front, I can go ahead and plant and do this. If I had some soil disturbance up front, roll out the root ball, you couldn't do that. Here, it was running straight up the screen there, just open it up, not see it, and close it up. And I can't drive that accurate. I can't get it drop that accurate. But again, plant, get the seed into the soil, it works. Make sure there's enough down pressure. Make sure the disc is sharp. Make sure you get the seed and soil contact. And again, back in the 80s, I worked with farmers across the state. I had this one grant for uh, six years, actually, where I took about 50 farmers a year, said, let's take you your soil, your management, your equipment, compared to what you're doing now to no-till. I learned a lot back then. 
Here's a producer of an old John Deere 507 tool bar, no tilling. Again, our equipment's changed. This is back in the 80s. We didn't have the new fancy equipment. We didn't have the technology. We didn't have the hybrids, varieties, pesticides, everything else. Again, bean stand looked like that. Uh, handle the residue, herbicide, rain being inactivated. Again, you gotta be careful on your herbicide programs. Up at Mead, we had a high yield project. There's, we had some high power researchers say they're gonna make 300 bushel corn in five years. It didn't quite make it, I think 289 was their best. But again, here is corn on corn. For corn on corn, uh, up there they decided to plant re right beside the old row rather than down the old row. Now planting down the old row, I like that when it comes to crop rotation with corn on corn, go beside the row. I hate monocrop, I hate the corn on corn. Now that one row is stunned a little bit, he is on the edge of the wheel track. If you really want to stun him, plant between the rows and you put a row in the wheel track and worse than that, you wear out your track tires real fast because you're driving on the old row. We never drive on the old row. When we plant down. Again, putting wheat in the rotation. A lot of people say, well, you can't really fit wheat in the rotation. Here in Southeast Nebraska, we're lucky enough because when soybeans come off, we still get time to plant wheat. We get that wheat crop the next year, opens up some opportunities. I'll talk a little bit about those opportunities so Nathan. But again, here's soybeans planted in the wheat stubble. A lot of farmers say, well, it's so cold and wet under that wheat stubble. This is about 80 bushel wheat that year. Planted soybeans on April 15th in an area of the state that a lot of people say you can't plant beans till May 1 because the soil's not warm enough. It wasn't cold and wet. It's good internal drainage of well-structured no-till soil. We had an extra couple weeks of growing soybeans. And as you plant soybeans earlier, yields go up. Now, soybeans, wheat, narrow row crops. I already told you the keys, cut and handle residue, penetrate soil, seed soil contact, close the seed bee. I already showed you that plugged up drill. Might be only one fourth the room for residue flow, so residue behind the combine is more important. But again, when it comes to the narrow row crops, the guys down south love wheat in the rotation because they can double crop. Up here, we can do it because we can do it right after uh, the bean harvest. Further north, some people say, well, I might give up the crop here in the rotation because I can't get wheat seeded soon enough. So again, we've got to manage some things a little different, perhaps. But again, out western Nebraska, where wheat was king, a lot of people had shank openers and had to cut through the clods and dry soil that they did with all the tillage and wheat fallow in particular, trying to find moisture. Again, cut and handle residue, they couldn't do it. They put smooth, straight residue cutting colders in their drills rather than a tillage colder because the shank is already doing tillage. But again, no-till got started out there with the shank drills. I said earlier, the corn planters, the runners disappeared, everybody's going dis. Same thing's happening on drills too. The shanks are disappearing. You know, some people took uh, tillage tools, tried to make them into seeders, and here, that first step, cut or handle residue, the front gang, cut it loose nicely to plug up the rear gang. So again, the tillage is dropping out of the drills we're seeing on the market today. Uh, shanks, like I say, are disappearing. Uh, some are going to narrower points, trying to get less soil disturbance, but again, that's just basically a chisel pile putting seed in the ground. You don't have uniformity depth control. When it comes to depth control, it makes a big difference on overwintering ability. You know, something like that, you may go over a high spot and the seeds might be that deep. Another low spot, seeds are on top of the ground. Again, we're seeing changes in our drills. One thing in some of the old drills, though, I love the press wheels. They're large enough diameter to get you good seed to soil contact. And as the new drills, they're going on smaller, but they're doing different things for that seed to soil contact, closing the seed bee. Again, here's a, in a no-till situation. We're seeing changes. That was a shank drill there, so a little bit too much soil disturbance. And one of the reasons that they had those shank drills was, like I say, to cut down the moisture. Also, trying to make a little valley there, such that when they did get rain or snow, it fell there in the seed, and if they had blowing sands, the seedling was being protected. Those are all tilled soil problems. As you go to no-till, we find we can leave that soil flat, leave the residue cover, just go ahead and drill right through it. Uh, I've told some of these some people about this. Uh, Mick, this is that Christmas drill that took over to Turkey. Uh, so again, helping them there. We're actually double cropping there, combining the wheat, the seed and corn with that crust buster. But again, when it comes to uh, the concepts of conservation agriculture, I said we're going to simulate that soil. We want to increase that biological diversity out there. And that's where the wheat really helps us out because it is that cool season grass. Put that in the rotation really helps build that soil up. Uh, Stuart and I in the Rogers Memorial Farm, we've had some fields there that have been row crops for years. We started purposely rotating wheat through there so we get cover crops in there, get the soil biological diversity up. And it's amazing how much we change the soils. And again, we got to start thinking about that, putting the wheat in rotation. 
if you've got livestock after the wheat, you can get, put in a short season forage or something, or you can use cover crops. And I've had some farmers over the years say, oh, I can't make any money on wheat. Well, we gotta look at other <laughs> opportunities. You know, let's say corn, soybeans, relative profit potential one. That's why the corn belts, corn, soybeans. Wheat properly managed, depends where you're at, it might be a three quarter. Now, if you're gonna grow one crop a year, you're not gonna grow wheat. But wheat comes off soon enough, I can put in a short season forage. Now, short season forage itself might be only a half. You wouldn't do one crop a year of just the forage. Well, what if you took the three quarter of the wheat plus the half of the short season forage, now it's one and a quarter, that beats corn or wheat. And more importantly, you got a growing crop more like year round to uh, harvest more of that sunlight and carbon dioxide that's free. And you're gonna use the water when it's available. That hot spell during the summer, I'm not really using a lot of water because wheat uses it early and the forage is gonna use it later. So again, we start thinking about matching our crops, our diversity, our rotations to one mother nature that lets us grow things. And so again, I don't have livestock. I used to build the soil, feed the soil livestock itself. Again, we start thinking about drills. Uh, you know, when soybeans, drilled soybeans really took off, there's a lot of farmers went out and got drills. You know, original drills here in eastern Nebraska were typically something like this, a low lightweight disc, a, a little bit of seed to soil contact there. And that was again because we're used to till soils. And people said, well, I can go no-till, and the company sold colders out front to make it a no-till. Remember, just like the planters, the colders put tillage back in the system. That's a one-pass tillage and planting system, in my opinion. Uh, some say, well, we got these special no-till drills. No, that's still just a conventional till drill been adapted. And this was on a field day we did where uh, Great Plains had their no-till drill there. It's a lot bigger, a lot heavier, designed for no-till. Look behind there, there's some residue standing there. Look in the pass next to it. There's next to no residue left. Remember I said the keys are residue and minimal soil disturbance? They called that a no-till drill. That was one of these wavy colder drills, about eight mile an hour. Again, I had an old timer stand there and say, I can disc and leave more residue than that. And I go, so can I. He says, yeah, but NRCS will throw me out of conservation compliance because I disced. Yet they'll call this no-till. No, that's a one pass tillage and planting system in my opinion. Go away from the colders. The drill companies are coming in with this so that it can handle no-till. I already showed you that one. Again, divide by four when it comes to residue flow. Multiply by four when it comes to weight for penetration. Again, this was a demo back in the 60s, or in the 80s, I'm sorry. Uh, this dealer was trying to sell drill, I was trying to sell conservation tillage. He started planting and every soybean seed is on top of the ground. He said, no problem, you tighten these down pressure springs back here, you can put 300 pounds per opener. I'm sitting there doing a math problem in my head. 300 times 24 openers on a 15 foot drill is 7,200 pounds. He says, what's your drill weight? He says, oh, about 5,000 pounds, so you can pick it up. 5,000 pounds this way and 7,200 pounds this way. That drive wheel is about six inches off the ground. We asked for volunteers from the audience, and I do not recommend this, but that's what it took. And again, there's a lot of people out there trying to sell no-till at that time who didn't understand no-till. The good news is once you start building a soil structure, you don't need as much weight. The bad news is the first year when you don't have a soil structure, and if you have a failure, you're never going to go back. Now here's the dealer who understand it, understood it. Look how many weights he's tacked on there. That three-point mountain drill is no longer safe to handle on a three-point. It had three-point uh, conversions to pull pipes. Very few three-point mountain drills left out there because, again, the weight, safety, stability, handling. Uh, pull pipe equipment, again, another axle handling the load is so safe for going down the road to transport. So again, we've got to think about these things. Uh, the Marlis drill was a narrow colder tucked in close. But again, that colder was bigger than the openers. The old openers were 12, 13, 14 inch discs. The new ones are 15, 16, 18 inch discs. We're doing without the colders now. So again, no-till's changing. As we're saving money by not putting colders on, we can start doing things like parallel linkage up here for more uniform depth control. It gives you a better seed to soil contact when you're on a parallel link rather than a swing arm. When the swing arm goes up, we lose seed to soil contact. So again, the drills are changing. This is a hay buster uh, drill also sold by Vermeer for a while. There's railroad rail hiding back here for weight. Again, you got the number, more openers out there. Crust buster, we used to borrow this one uh, a couple of times. We liked it so well, we went ahead and bought a crust buster ourselves. But again, when it comes to weight, crust buster, when they're in the back notch of down pressure, will say 500 pounds per opener. Now, this was 22 openers, eight inch spacing. Ours is 24 on seven and a half. 
But if you take 24 openers at 500 pounds, that means that drill has to weigh 12,000 pounds or more. Even on the second notch here at 250, we're starting to lift the drive wheels off the ground. So when we bought the Crest Buster, we put weights on it. Full set of 20 suitcase weights. We filled the beam with flat steel, the beam under the box with flat steel. We bought markers, not so much that we needed markers all the time, but they weighed 800 pounds. And that 15 foot drill, we added over 4,000 pounds of weight. We go, huh? Ship weight was 7,900. At 500 pounds per row, on, 12, on 24 openers would be 12,000 pounds. 7,900 plus 4,000 pounds of weight, we're still on the short side. But if our box was half full and our fertilizer tank was full, we were over 14,000 pounds. There wasn't anything we couldn't plant through. So again, pay attention to that. Uh, that drill, uh, we replaced it. We still added the weights. Weight bracket's a little bit different now. Crustbuster ship weight now is 11,008, correct, same model. They've been watching us from the factory. That beam, that beam and the hitch are already filled for you. So again, industry's responding. Back before, the old one had some extra weights even back here in the walkboard. But here we are seeding wheat right after soybean harvest. Again, uniform spread of the residue. Can you tell where the combine went? Can't. It's going to be a lot better wheat stand. Minimal soil disturbance there. Got a nice mulch there. That mulch is going to hold the moisture. It's going to get that wheat up and growing. It's going to help protect the wheat when it comes to reducing winter kill. So again, doing a good job. We like planting wheat a little bit deeper as well. As I plant deeper, I get that crown down deeper. It reduces winter kill as well. Uh, winter kill is a problem in till loose soils when you're shallow planting, when the ground starts to heave and move in firm no-till soils. We haven't had winter kill problems for years. So again, think about proper seeding. Again, here's another producer planting wheat after soybean harvest. Uh, sunflower drill here. It's similar to the crust buster. Depth controls behind staggered double disc openers. Good down pressure, a lot of built-in weight in the frame. It turns out a lot of times on small plot drills, we have problems because we don't have the iron that a big folding frame has. I've seen a lot of our plot drills where we had to add a bunch of weight to make them work compared to the drills you guys might be running. So again, pay attention to the weight. Again, here's the, our older one. Uh, depth control is behind. I like that when it comes to leaving residue standing, especially for fall seeded crops. That standing residue helps catch snowfall. And again, this is uh, about uh, 200, 220 bushel corn residue day after harvest out there seeding a cover crop, in this case, rather than wheat. That residue is still standing there. A lot of people say, well, i got to get some, a vertical tillage tool to process the residue. I go, why? Vertical tillage cuts and sizes the residue. That's as small so does the drill. Vertical tillage takes the residue and puts it in contact with soil. soil. That's as so does the drill. The drill puts a living seed in the ground to feed the soil system. This is the same field the next spring. Our biology activity is all that corn residue is disappearing. Biology activity there is an Austrian winter pea crop growing, fixing some nitrogen for me. So again, cover crops give you some options there to help build soil health. Well, rather than a cover crop, use a cash crop. Plant wheat, plant maybe Austrian winter peas for grain. So again, think about feeding the soil system. And again, feeding the soil system, we got wheat in the rotation because we like to feed the soil system. Here's our wheat after harvest and after drilling a cover crop. Drill already went through there. Depth controls behind. Opener just slides down through. You can see a little bit of soil disturbance there. This is where the combine and tractor went. This is the extra wheel on the drill. But again, I love that standing residue there to catch snowfall. I hate the flattened residue. And that's what our cover crop looks like. We've got about a 14-way mix there. And again, cover crop's a completely different talk. I would have me back sometime to talk cover crops. But again, we're feeding the soil system there. Now, if you're a livestock man, feed your livestock there. Again, the income that some people say I lose on wheat, I've just gained by building the soil for us or feeding livestock for you. Ours is all winter kill, frosts down. Here's the next spring, plant soybeans into it. Again, some weight on the planter to make sure it works, some water splash in the tank so the springs work. We love that system. Really building carbon into the soil, helping build organic matter. John Deere drill, depth controls beside the opener. Now the big disc, nice cut residue, good down pressure, good weight. The depth control beside the opener, you'll flatten every piece of residue out there. Now in spring planting, even in front of the spring rains, I had a little flattened residue absorb raindrop impact. For fall planting of wheat, where I want to catch snow and reduce winter kill, that's not going to be so nice. You can rearrange the drill a little bit. In the John Deere owner's manual, it talked about rearranging. You take one-fourth the openers from the front, 
flop it with one port, the opener's in the back, and then you get these side by side, but more important, you get this look, gap here, and that's the leave corner as you stand it. Now you get a little pinch between those. If you take half the openers from the front, swap them to half the openers in the back, now you don't have that pinch effect, and you leave a lot more residue standing. Leave residue standing because this wheel runs over this residue, plants on this side, the wheel behind runs over the same residue, but plants on the other side for your rows. Leave some standing residue. You can go to narrow depth gauge wheels, leave more standing residue. The narrow depth gauge wheels are about two and a half rather than four and a half, so it leaves more residue standing. Or you can rearrange the openers and use narrow depth gauge wheels. Here's a Dwayne Beck's drill up at Pier Dakota Lakes Research Farm. Again, this wheel runs over the residue, plants the row on this side, the wheel behind it puts the row on the other side, and look how much residue you can leave standing between. Now, with the narrow depth gauge wheels on, rather than being a true seven and a half inch spacing, it hits more like a five by 10, to get the wheels in the same place, and leaves a lot more residue standing. And again, up there in uh, Pierre, South Dakota, that standing residue catches snow and really reduces the winter kill. So again, you gotta think about the system. Sometimes you want the wheels to run over the residue. Here's a producer in Kansas I met who plants covers after wheat harvest, put more carbon in the system, he's growing a lot of carbon there. He's out there planting into that, he's rolling the residue down with that drill. So again, springtime I can like the flattened residue. Fall, I like it standing. Now rather than build the soil, maybe it's gonna be feed the cattle. Again, that adds some extra income, some profit potential. Nathan's gonna talk more about more reasons why to grow wheat. Now again, with wheat and the rotation, some people say, well, you know, wheat didn't quite make as much money. If you're a livestock man, you got pasture or rangeland. Go out there, you put a cover crop out there for grazing purposes. Now, you may have lost money on the wheat, maybe, I don't know. You may not regained it all on the grazing, I don't know. But I can guarantee you, you gained a heck of a lot back there on the pasture and rangeland by giving it recovery time. Again, don't think about that single acre, think about your entire farm. We've got people in pasture and rangeland that graze everything down and go into winter with no root reserve. Next spring, it doesn't grow much. By getting the cattle off there, yes, I'm going to eat over here, but the dollar's impact is over there. So again, livestock man really opens up your options when you throw wheat in rotation and looking at cover crops. Now, if you're lucky enough to be further south, you can double crop. A double crop for us here might be grazing, it might be forage. Uh, as far as going to grain, may or may not make it. Unless you cheat a little bit, plant soybeans early for your double crop. It's called relay cropping. It was popular here in Nebraska for a while. Uh, again, put wheat in the rotation. And when you combine the wheat, the soybeans are already up and growing. And like the relay race, you start the soybeans before the wheat is done. Now, there's a little differences in management there. A lot of it is being done out in seed corn production areas. You over fertilize and over water seed corn because it's a valuable crop. You want to make sure you got good production. That extra water in the profile, extra nitrogen in the profile, off season precip, we had environmental problems by leaching groundwater, or leaching nitrates to the groundwater. By planting wheat there, there's a lot of these guys doing the wheat without any fertilizer because they already have plenty of fertilizer in the soil profile. There's a nitrogen scavenger. Again, there's this is a ridge till fur irrigator, but he's planting the wheat there. In the spring then, before the wheat heads, they plant the soybeans. Now you do it before the wheat heads because Fusarium stock rotting corn, Fusarium head blight in wheat related. And the tires, if you had any problems in the corn, you bring tires up and inoculate your heads during blooming, you can really screw up your wheat production. So they learn you plant it early. This guy built a planter that's an offset. It's an odd row planter, but he has to offset it because he's planting his wheel treads. Now, by letting the planting the beans early before the wheat heads, it actually gives you better bean yields because they're bigger when the wheat matures. It cuts a little bit on the wheat yield, perhaps. The other thing they played with is how wide does the gap have to be? The narrower the gap, the better the wheat yield. The wider the gap, the better the bean yield. So there's some trade-offs. Which are you, a bean producer, a wheat producer, or are you feeding the soil? Now, here's a producer who went the other way. He left his corn planter alone, but he bought tracks to spread out so you plant down the wheel row. Here he's planting later, the wheat's already headed, done blooming, so again reduces the chances of fusarium. However, your beans don't get near as much of a head start. Get better wheat yields. So again, which are you, a bean or a wheat producer? Now the guy's doing it out uh, central Nebraska under irrigation that was working great for him. 
I tried it for three years at Rogers Morrow Farm, and I gave up about one third of, or two thirds of my bean yield because the wheat already used out of the fall moisture. You know what? I had the wheat harvested, and one th third of the beans was still enough money to justify running the combine. And I had a living root there almost year round. Again, out in central Nebraska where they're combining, beans ready going. Under irrigation, it turns out they had to apply about six extra inches of water compared to their other beans, which isn't bad considering they already had a wheat crop in the bin. But again, extra income. And wheat allowed them, I can say a one and one for yield, well, that's in a two year period. They were going across a, well, I did actually wheat, beans, wheat, beans, wheat, beans for three years, I had six harvests. But now, a one plus a half or a third is still better than a one. So again, you gotta think about opportunities. And I built a planter, we did wheat bean at the Rogers Memorial Farm. As a wheat bean, I didn't have to worry about fusarium head scab issues. So again, I can plant any time as far as that goes. Again, some weight hiding there to get the openers in. Built the cedars offset. It looks odd because there's three rows on this side and only two rows on this side. But again, it worked in dry land. Not highly recommended because you do give up a little yield. I do recommend it though having a living roof there. So back to cedars, uh, the John Deere type cedar. Uh, John Deere had a wider press wheel here designed for uh, tilled soils. Go to a narrower press wheel for better seed to soil contact. Actually help reduce winter kill by pushing that seed down a little deeper as well. John Deere's wheel was a little bit wider. John Deere's wheel, uh, people were buying the narrow wheel, so John Deere started making their own narrow wheel. It went from an inch and a quarter down to three quarter inch. The other companies out there, are they're about a half inch or three eighths inch, depending upon the company. So again, better seed to soil contact, better overwintering. This guy put the narrow depth gauge wheels on. He's got the narrow wheels on. He's got the standard, or the John Deere narrow wheel on. He's got John Deere's cast iron. He's got a spoke closer wheel on. And I said, well, which do you like better? He said, well, in dry soil, you get better seed to soil contact with this one, and you get better CD closing with this one. In wet soil, this one's a little bit better because it doesn't press as seed on as, as bad, doesn't compact the seed as much, and the wet soil, this gives you loose soil so the CD doesn't open back up. I looked at that and I said, well, you're right half of the time this way. <laughs> but again, he's running this, trying to evaluate it, and he says, push comes to shove, he'd be set up with something like that, with something like that for his fall seeded wheat, and for his spring seeded soybeans, he'd be this with this. Again, how many times, are we, how many people are willing to take the time to swap it in and out? Again, think about the systems approach. If you're thinking about buying a cedar to get into wheat, get into cover crops, uh, some people go out and look at used uh, John Deere's, for instance, they're fairly common. Go to your dealer and buy, uh, buy or borrow one new seed boot. Seed boots wear such that you can't tell they're worn when you're looking at it. When you get to the field, it may not be performing right. This one has one seed boot that's worn out. That one. Those are shot. Those been, should have been replaced years ago. This is wearing to the point it's starting to cup. You're not going to get good, accurate seed placement. And especially when it comes to wheat and reducing winter kill, you need that good, solid seed placement to get a good root system. When it's worn like this, you have no idea where that seed's going to end up. Is it at the bottom of the V or the side of the V? Is it, who knows? Again, take care of your seeder. Uh, get that proper seed placement. Make sure there's weight. I talked earlier about weight. Again, that deer has good heavy springs, looks heavy, but I've seen too often where they rotate to get the rock shaft to get good depth control. As the tail starts coming up, I lose seed to soil contact, CD closing. Again, if you don't firm that soil up, winter kill becomes more of a problem. Get that seed in the ground. They have to add weight. This is a producer actually planting wheat in the, near Syracuse. He's got starter fertilizer on, putting it down in furrow. He took second cutting alfalfa away for regrowth and killed it. Had a little bit of soil moisture recharge, but that ground was hard because it was alfalfa. The extra weight was needed. So again, think about weight, penetration. Down a side hill, side hill drift problems. Deer's openers are on a seven degree angle. When the thing drifted downhill on him, this side is 14 degree angle doing some tillage. This side is zero degree angle, but not doing much. What happened though is when it drifted downhill, the press wheel that's supposed to be on top of the seed is no longer on the seed. It becomes a problem. Side hill drift, you gotta put the weight in back to get these tires to bite the ground so they don't slide downhill. That sounds like a no-brainer. Deer's weight brackets for the weights are on the front. Don't put them up front, put them on the back. And you got a wing, make sure you put them on the wing as well. Too often I've seen where there's people say, oh, there's plenty of weight in the middle, they forget about the wings. 
as it starts coming up. Get the weight on the back of those heaters. Here's Case IH the SDX, weight on the back. This is a 30 foot drill. It's got 36 weights in the back. Again, this is stripper head wheat harvest uh, out there seeding uh, beans the next spring. Again, add the weight. This is actually Mark Watson's drill out of Alliance. He does some custom work. It worked fine for him. When he started doing custom work, he got to some fields that that was not enough weight. 36 front end weights across a 30 foot drill. He put on water tanks. Now they're staggered goofy here, but when the thing folds up, all three water tanks are in a row. Now you can't fold it with water in there, so he's got quick connectors and valves. He takes the 600 gallons of water, puts it in his truck, goes down the road. The drill is now safer for transport because it's 600 gallons of water lighter. When he gets to the field and unfolds, if it's got good soil structure, he doesn't need the extra weight. If it's one that doesn't have soil structure yet, he can blow the water in for weight. Again, start thinking about flexibility, start thinking about safety, start thinking about transport. Here's a producer in South Australia I visited. He's taking his seeder, put narrow depth gauge wheels on it, put spoke closing wheels on it, and he moved it down to six inch spacing. He's got more openers per foot of width now. And he's not, he's sort of colorblind when it comes to weights, but look how many weights all across the back of the seeder to make sure that thing stays in the ground. And he's in a low rainfall area, he's using cover crops and he loves wheat. Again, growing when the water's available. When the water's not available in the heat of the summer is when the wheat's already been harvested and the cover crops are gonna be coming later. Again, put the water or the crops out there when the water's available. Here's one down by Claytonia in Nebraska. Wheat on 15 inch rows. And you look at that and go, well, the first thing you learn is weed control becomes important because you don't close canopy near as soon. But some of the varieties we have nowadays, the tillering, uh, the production, 15 inch rows isn't that much different than 12 inch rows we used to do out west all the time. They moved to 10 perhaps, we're at seven and a half. The advantage of this one is, that was planted with a Kinsey planter. Interplant units for 30 inch corn, 15 inch beans. There's adapter plates out there. There's adapter plates for a lot of these new air planters that are meter wheat. Now, don't own the drill. A planter does the wheat as well. Brings that into the rotation. 15 inch, like I say, there's a lot of them out there. Again, here's a producer. He's got sand and insecticide hopper here. He's got cast iron here. So they can go to 30 inch, or 30 down to 15s. His fertilizer's being carried here. These two are simply weight. They're filled with water. Now, there's eight up here, there's seven here. That's the way the original ones were built. If you look at the new ones available now, there's an, rather than, they call that a 815, they got an 816 now. Or maybe you got a, 1631, they got a 1632 now. What they do is offset the hitch, half a row space, and you apply it on both sides of the row. That gives you a far more uniform depth control because you're not bouncing down the old row. On this one, this will be bouncing the row. This one will be on a soft row. This one here is in a wheel track. That one's in a wheel track. That's on a soft row. By going on each side of the row, you get far more uniform stands. Now this happens to be a soybean special here. You can plant wheat in 15 inch rows. But look at the corners where you can leave standing to catch snow. Look at the more uniform depth control and see the soil contact you have because now you've got room for planter units underneath. And again, the advantage of the 15 inch, half as many openers, half as much weight. So again, start thinking about other opportunities. Now, 15 inch wheat, if I'm saving the cost of the equipment of not having to buy a drill, I could do it. Year in, year out, I like narrow rows. Commercial for Crop Watch, our crop production, crop scouting newsletter uh, through the growing season. It's also our portal for all our crop information out there. You just click on wheat fertility and it'll bring up the information we have in extension. With that, roughly done on time. Choppers, to me, open up the residue too much and it breaks down too fast. When you blow that out on the soil, that's a high biology, highly biological active soil. We leave our pieces long. By the next spring, they're still breaking down quite a bit. Um, now, the other thing is choppers, if it's set too fine, that residue out there can blow. The bigger pieces don't blow. I don't have the pictures in here, but when I do the full planter talk, I show a little something areas where residue's been cut loose or chopped too fine, or worse yet, by a chopping corn head. Chopping corn heads were not invented for no-till. Gehring Hoff invented that for Minnesota, 
where the day after corn harvest out there, the chisel plow and they're plugging up their chisel plows. They're cutting up the residue so they go through a chisel plow. Now, people thought it was for no-till. No, it was for tilled systems. And again, that chopping corn head takes horsepower, costs more, adds weight to the machine, and it gives you a residue that's gonna blow away. So again, the same reason I don't like the chopper, that residue can blow on you more. Now, granted, on our 15, 20 foot combines that we're running on our research farm, we can spread it pretty well. Some of these guys now have got a 45 foot head. That's the reason these new choppers are out there. But even then, the John Deere power board is not a chopper. You don't have to run the chopper, just spread the residue. Case IH didn't have a chopper option for years. They just spread it. So again, I like to keep the residue as whole as I can. Whole piece of residue is easier to throw further, especially if it's windy. I'm not sure if I added to Nathan's workload or took away from his workload. 